Hi, thank you, and welcome everyone. I appreciate you taking time out of your day to attend this webinar. I know a lot of you are just finishing up your work day. I am in Ohio, so I'm here on East Coast time. It's around 6 o'clock and it's dark, um, and I'm just looking forward to talking with you all for the next hour about assessing students with traumatic brain injuries. Um, and a little bit about my history. Uh, I've been the coordinator of the school psychology program at the University of Dayton for about 10 years now. But prior to that, I was a school psychologist. And I worked in a suburban district and then in an urban district and had a number of cases that of students who had presented with difficulties, some academic, some more social, emotional, behavioral, and who didn't typically fit the mold of a student with a learning disability or a student with um, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. And so they were students that were being referred to um, our intervention assistance team and to our evaluation team. And just with a little bit more digging and close assessment, um, we revealed that these um, few students to have um, previous traumatic brain injuries that were affecting their educational performance. So what we're going to talk about today, um, sorry, my slide is not advancing. Um, first, I'm going to give just a general discussion of the purpose of TBI assessment. Of course, it can be for special education evaluations, but we want to look at this in a bigger picture of ways that we can evaluate and assess students who've had traumatic brain injuries. Maybe it's not such a severe case that it would require special education. Um, but that we still want to make sure that we're very mindful of different techniques that we can use to evaluate their progress and determine what kinds of um, strategies, instructional strategies and interventions can work best for them. Um, we'll also talk a bit about what is unique about assessment of students with traumatic brain injuries because we're going to be applying a lot of assessment techniques that people who are part of a school-based evaluation and team already know how to do and do very well. And we'll talk a bit about how we can apply known strategies to this specific population and what maybe some of the um, approaches or techniques that are a bit different when we're working with students with TBI. Uh, we'll discuss who some of the school-based evaluators are, the different domains that they will be assessing, and then some specific tools and techniques. So when we're looking at the overall purpose of a TBI assessment, one main aspect that we're looking at is where are they performing presently. What's that present level of performance? And um, ideally we want to have some kind of mechanism that would allow us to compare that performance to baseline. So the school-based um, evaluation team is going to be doing a lot of detective work to find out what was that pre-injury level of functioning? What was that baseline cognitive, academic, social, emotional, behavioral level of performance? and then do an evaluation to see where are they performing now in comparison to that. We'll be looking at what that suspected effect of the traumatic brain injury is on the student's educational performance, and that's one of the key features that we're looking at in determining eligibility for special services, because there certainly can be students who have sustained traumatic brain injuries, they have that medical identification of a TBI, but if there's not a significant effect on educational performance, they may not be eligible for special education services. Um, a TBI assessment can help us identify what students' specific educational needs are and can allow for that progress monitoring across time. And that's one of the most important facets of a TBI assessment because the recovery trajectory might be um, quite steep and that's what we're certainly hoping for with students who've sustained brain injuries is that if there are significant deficits post-injury that there will be recovery. So a big part of what the school-based educational evaluation team can do is to track student improvement, track student progress, 
so they're not receiving unnecessary supports and services um, as they've gone through their recovery. Um, so here's the federal definition of TBI, and this is what we're going to be working from today um, because we have participants on this webinar from all kinds of different states. And some states will have a bit of an expanded definition of TBI. Um, for example, here in Ohio, we have a, an expanded definition of TBI, but the federal definition and of TBI focuses on um, an acquired injury to the brain caused by an external physical force. Um, so that external physical force could be a fall, it could be a gunshot wound, it could be um, someone's head hitting the steering wheel in a car accident, and that results in total or partial functional disability or psychosocial impairment or both. Um, and then the key is that it would adversely affect the child's educational performance. So again, this is when we're looking at whether the student would be qualifying for special education um, under the educational identification of TBI. Um, the term applies to open or closed head injury. So um, an open head injury would be more of a penetrating kind of wound um, that can occur like with a gunshot wound or a penetrating injury of an object falling on a student's head, or closed head injuries, which are more common, the types of head injuries caused by um, fights or falls, um, car accidents. And it results in impairments in one or more areas. And so these areas are the many domains that we're looking at when doing a TBI evaluation. So the educational planning team wants to make sure that they're carefully planning and evaluating each of these domains. Cognition, language, memory, attention, reasoning, abstract thinking, judgment, problem solving, sensory perceptual, perceptual and motor abilities, psychosocial behavior, physical functions, information processing, and speech. And because brain injuries, the mechanisms of brain injuries and the location of brain injuries and the severity of brain injuries can be so different, the, um, the injury will manifest so differently in all of your students. We also have to take the child's age into account. So the clusters of deficits in all of those areas may be very different from student to student. Um, and then in the federal definition, the term does not apply to brain injuries that are um, congenital or degenerative or brain injuries induced by birth trauma. So when we're looking at the special education identification of TBI, there has to be documentation of adverse effect of the injury or disability on the child's ability to learn and participate in school, and this negative impact must be substantial. So when you're bringing evaluation data to the table and having a discussion of whether a student would qualify for special education, those are a couple of the key features that you're going to be looking at. Um, how, how significant is the effect? Is it affecting the child's ability to learn, and how substantial is it? Um, one of the cases that I dealt with in my first year um, as a school psychologist took this third point into account, so, so that some of the effects of TBI aren't apparent until years after the injury. So I had a teacher refer a second grade student to our evaluation team and she was a very experienced um, seasoned educator and she just kept saying I've just never had anyone like her in my class she's you know she's just odd and that in some of her areas um, in the classroom she's fine and in other areas um, it just seems like it's not sinking in she described some sort of socially odd behaviors um, and the student was having significant trouble learning to read. And so as we were going through our, um, our evaluation, our subsequent evaluation of the student, 
um, and I was doing my interview with her parents, we discovered that she had been hit by a car when she was two years old. And this wasn't documented in any of her educational records. Um, when the student had been discussed in previous intervention meetings, the injury didn't come up because it had happened so long ago and it was before she was in school. Um, and when their child was hospitalized at the age of two and the doctor said, well, she's fine, she's, she's going to be fine, that is such a relief to parents. And when the child is then in second grade and experiencing some social issues and some learning issues and memory problems, they weren't immediately going to that old injury and saying, oh, they, this is something we need you to know about. It took you know, a lot of discussion with them and um, before that injury even came up in discussing her medical background. So even though she had sustained that injury um, five years earlier, she certainly was able to qualify under the TBI category um, because the child was only now growing into her disability when she was in kindergarten and when she was in first grade. Um, the types of cognitive activities and more complex kinds of social um, interactions weren't necessarily required. So as she got a little bit older, they became more evident. You also often see this in students when they're heading into middle school where they were performing adequately in elementary school, but then when they're in middle school and more abstract thinking, more um, delayed gratification, more judgment, more problem-solving kinds of skills are required, sometimes then you'll see a student who'd sustained a, brain, sustained a brain injury many years earlier and functioned okay in elementary school fall farther behind their peers. Um, and students with TBI often go unidentified altogether, um, sometimes because educational teams aren't trained well enough in understanding traumatic brain injuries and how to appropriately utilize that, um, that definition when making a special education identification. Um, and often what we see is that these students are misidentified, that they're determined eligible for services under other eligibility categories like a student with a learning disability or an emotional disturbance or an other health impairment Again, because the um, history of a brain injury maybe isn't made known to the school team um, or there's a lack of what the school deems appropriate medical documentation. And so what we see is that TBI is continually considered a low incidence disability um, when in fact it's really not a low incidence occurrence at all. So some of the things that are unique about assessment of students with TBI um, is that what we often see when doing these evaluations is um, uneven patterns of strengths and weaknesses. Um, we also see inconsistent performance from day to day. So as I was mentioning earlier in the webinar, in my practice as a school psychologist, I had a couple of these very interesting cases of students one example was a student who had been, it had been evaluated a couple of times in the early years of elementary school but didn't qualify for services because when taken together, her um, academic achievement and her cognitive ability were low average overall. But when you really kind of dug in and looked at the profiles of what led to those low average academic and cognitive scores was um, very spotty up and down patterns of strengths and weaknesses of some areas where she was performing above average, um, some domains where she was above average, and some where she was significantly below average. Um, and then also that inconsistent performance from day to day um, can lead to grades and scores that taken together maybe low average, but really when we look at the student's um, performance in, uh, class, in individual classes, they may tell a bit of a different story. 
Um, immediately post brain injury when students are coming back to school, it's important that all of the educators, particularly those on the evaluation team, consider the, the struggle that the student may be experiencing with being back to school. Um, they may have missed a lot of instruction. There may be some um, difficulty just reintegrating socially with peers after a period of time in a hospital or rehabilitation um, center. And of course, all of that can affect their ability to perform well on tests, either in the classroom or if they're pulled out for an evaluation. Um, and then it's also important to keep in mind that the student's skills can change very rapidly during the recovery process from a brain injury. So the school team may get an outside report from the hospital or from a neuropsychologist that tells one story about that child's strengths and weaknesses and needs, but as they're observing the student in the classroom and collecting classroom data and doing the school-based evaluation, those results may be telling a bit of a different story um, simply because the student has had an opportunity to recover since receiving the hospital evaluation or the neuropsych eval. So that just um, is important to emphasize so that the school team understands that a student with a brain injury needs more frequent assessment than your typical students who are coming to you with other disabilities. So what this um, graph shows is that some students with TBI will have skills that develop but at a slower rate than peers. So for example, Jack was a nine-year-old third grader and he sustained a severe TBI and following his injury, um, he had difficulty keeping pace with his age-related peers in reading, spelling, and math. So in this example, when he came back to school, the knowledge that he already had was still largely intact. But across time, his peers um, learned at a greater rate than Jack. And so this kind of shows him falling behind. So you'll certainly have some students who post-injury are immediately performing well below their typical same age peers, but when you are have a school team doing a school-based evaluation, what you may see is that um, immediately following the injury, the student's crystallized knowledge really is largely still intact. So that's a student that you want to follow and that you want to track and that you want to continue to assess across time. Um, this slide shows a bit of what I was discussing before with um, the student who had the late onset effects, where immediately post-injury, you'll have some students who um, across time are able to keep on par with their typical same age peers and then experience um, sort of a, a breaking point with their learning where they grow into their symptoms with the passage of time. So you see sort of that early medical and neurological recovery and then um, a, a larger gap between the injured student and typical same age peers. So in this example, Maria sustained a severe brain injury in second grade, was on pace with her peers until middle school, and at that point, problems in organization and planning of schoolwork um, and activities became more apparent. Essentially, when her peers were um, able to kind of take off with their executive functioning skills and abstract thinking, she was not developing those skills on par with them. On our school-based evaluation team, this, this can vary from school to school or from district to district, but when we're looking at a special education evaluation, typically we'll see the core members include the school psychologist, the speech-language pathologist, the occupational therapist, physical therapist, the school nurse, and teachers. And all of those people on the school-based evaluation team gather information from different um, entities in different domains. So they'll gather information from the student, the parents, from outside hospital, physicians, therapists, current and past teachers, and any other relevant sources. 
and they are required to use a variety of assessment techniques. So we have these multiple evaluators getting information from um, multiple sources using multiple techniques. And then these are the key domains that the evaluators are going to be looking at. The cognitive domain includes um, executive functions, so we're going to be doing a careful assessment of the student's attention, reasoning, judgment, problem solving, and memory. And so this doesn't just mean a single point in time IQ test, and that certainly may be part of the cognitive assessment but we really want to look at cognition more broadly. How does the student approach problems in day-to-day -day life? And I think for me as a school psychologist, that's one of my favorite parts of the job, is I'm not just working in a clinical setting where kids would come to me for um, just testing, but I had that opportunity to actually go into the classroom to see how that student processes information in that context. You can really do that ecological assessment of all of these domains, including cognition. Um, the academic domains, so reading, math, writing, um, social studies and science. Behavioral domains, and that includes adaptive behavior, self-care, functional communication, um, psychosocial domains, how do they process their emotions, how do they relate to others. Again, I'll talk some about more objective measures of these domains, such as the psychosocial domain, but also how all of the members of the educational team can look at the child in the actual environment and in their context to see how they are able to relate to others and how they're able to manage their emotions and how that compares to their functioning prior to their injury. Um, communication, and this is where the speech language therapist is key on the team. Um, the communication domain includes speech and language, their ability to um, understand pragmatics. Sensory perceptual, that includes their vision and hearing and then their motor abilities. The occupational therapist will typically do the evaluation for fine motor abilities. The physical therapist may be called in to do an evaluation of gross motor abilities. Um, sometimes there's a brief screening that's done for motor abilities, and if there aren't any discernible issues that require a more in-depth evaluation, um, they the occupational or physical therapist may or may not be involved. These are some of the tools and techniques that the um, majority of the rest of this webinar are going to go in depth with um, giving some examples and some explanations, your file review, observations, interviews, checklists and rating scales, standardized norm reference tests, curriculum-based measures, functional behavioral assessment, and um, computer-based neurocognitive tests. So first of all, the file review. Um, for those of you who are school-based practitioners, this is often the first thing you do when you're conducting your psychoeducational evaluation, the collection of background information. And in a TBI assessment, you really are doing your detective work. So you're looking at the medical history, both the recent history of um, the brain injury that was sustained, but also looking at prior medical history. It's ideal if you can get a signed release to talk directly with the physician who was treating the student um, related to the brain injury and you want to make sure that you gather any historical information related to a history of any previous brain injuries, including mild brain injuries. The student had prior concussions and then sustained a more severe brain injury. That's important to document in your evaluation. Um, collecting family history information, 
your student's school history, and that's key because one of the distinct features of a TBI eval is that you're not just documenting how the student is performing at that point in time, but you're doing that careful comparison to how the student is performing in relation to his or her pre-injury skills and abilities. So you really want to be able to paint that comprehensive picture of the student's functioning prior to the injury. So all of these features are important to take into consideration because pre-injury psychiatric, neuropsychological, or family problems can affect a student's recovery or long-term outcome. So what we often see is that if a student already had um, psychiatric issues, if they had pre-existing um, anxiety or depression, a brain injury can make those worse. If they had previous sleep problems, a brain injury can make those um, much worse. If a student already had a history of migraines, then that is often a feature that is a persistent problem and is significantly worse post-injury. Um, and then it's important that you take into account those family variables because that can um, also be a significant protective factor for a student who has sustained a brain injury. Um, in working with students with other types of disabilities, you often have families who've had this gradual realization that there might be something um, about their child that would warrant special attention or specialized instruction. And they have this gradual realization that their child's learning or behavior may be different than typical same age peers. And this is one of the main things that's different about a TBI is it is a, um, a point in time change. My child used to be like this and now they are like this. So families often go through a tremendous grieving process um, after a brain injury and the school can be such a source of um, support for the child and for the family. And it's really important that the, that the school team understand some of these family variables that may come into play. Um, the observation is one of, in my opinion, it is one of the most important pieces of the evaluation for a student with a brain injury. It lets the evaluator get information about a child um, in the natural setting. So you may be someone, you may be a school psychologist, you may be a speech pathologist or an OT or PT, and you might certainly pull the child for one-on-one -on -one testing or evaluation, and you can observe the child in that individual setting too, and that's important to um, to take note of approach to problems and if there's a delay in response time and how persistent they are in answering questions, how easily they establish or you establish rapport with them. But you also want to take that opportunity to observe the child in his or her natural setting, both in an academic classroom kind of setting and in an unstructured setting like the cafeteria, the hallway. Um, you want to collect that data across time in multiple settings, um, across observers. It, um, you, it shouldn't just be the teacher or just the school psychologist providing observational data on the student. Um, also observing the student across tasks, maybe observing them doing some group work, working in a one-on-one -on -one kind of setting. And the observation data can allow the evaluators to compare the child across time to his or herself, but also compare the child's functioning to typical same age peers. And I want you all to kind of take note of all of these different things that you can take into account in doing the observation. You want to think about how the student interacts with his or her environment, the people in his or her environment, the adults and the children, the teacher and peers, how they interact with their physical space and how they interact with materials. 
Sometimes after an injury, you'll see a change in a child's physical awareness of their body in space and how close they get to people when they talk to them, um, how adeptly or clumsily they interact with a pen and pencil or their materials. All of those things can be um, taken into account in observation. Or whether the child's able to begin a task or assignment independently or need multiple prompts and cues? Do they need reminders to stay on task? And if so, how frequent those reminders are needed? Um, how, again, how they relate to their physical space? Do they become lost or confused going from room to room? How well do they follow directions? What type of directions can they follow? And how complex? So sometimes this might involve front-loading your observation a bit. For example, if you're a school psychologist, you can let the teacher know that you're coming into the classroom to observe and ask them to give the student multi-step directions so that you, as an external observer, can be taking notes so the teacher doesn't have to be writing things down um, while this task is going on, but seeing how um, lengthy and complex of directions the student is able to follow. Um, does the student forget to do things when asked, even with reminders? Is there a difference in their ability to carry out tasks if the instruction is presented in writing versus if it is presented orally? Um, are they submitting incomplete assignments? Are they making careless errors? So this involves observation of their, um, of their work, of their school products? Do they have trouble comprehending new concepts? And is frequent repetition and concrete demonstration required for new learning? And that's important to note because already you're beginning to formulate your instructional strategies that will go into an educational plan. So if it's a student who qualifies for special education, these may be things that can inform your strategies that go in their IEP as far as how they learn best. So just briefly, some different types of observation strategies. And um, depending on your profession, and this is where a webinar is a little challenging because I can't see my audience and I can't say or ask what your training and your background is. So some of you may be very well trained in all of these different types of observation strategies. But even if that's the case, I want you to really think about a student with a traumatic brain injury when thinking about how you can utilize these different strategies. Um, because what I often see in educational teams is that we sort of have our go-to way of recording and reporting observation, observational data. So a lot of educators will kind of do uh, maybe some narrative recording and a specific type of interval recording. So think about all of these different strategies you can utilize and how they may be particularly beneficial for students with brain injuries. So the first one is your narrative recording. And some people will call these like running records. And this tells a story. The drawback of a narrative recording is that it's a fairly subjective way of reporting observational data, but it can really paint a picture of what a student um, is doing at, at a certain point of time. And so you would just note the, the date and the setting, the start time and end time of the observation. And so for this one, we have Jane enters the classroom and touches items on other students' desks as she walks to her seat. Mrs. Smith, who's the teacher, does not see Jane touching other students' property. Another student, Joey, says, Jane, quit touching my stuff. Jane says quietly, I can do what I want. Jane, um, Joey walks away. Jane picks up a pencil from another student's desk and throws it at Joey. Mrs. Smith observed this and said to Jane, keep your hands to yourself and return to your desk. Jane remains standing. So if you're doing a narrative recording, you want to write what you see as objectively as possible and not make inferences of Jane is mad or anything like that. But this really does paint a picture of the student's behavior. 
It's useful for gathering informa information about antecedents and maintaining consequences, what might trigger a behavior, what might um, keep a behavior persisting. It can help define target behaviors, again, that might be folded into a behavioral plan or an IEP um, later in a student's programming. So some behaviors that we saw, that we saw in the example were noncompliance, wandering, and bothering peers. Um, another type of observational data collection is utilizing um, what's called an ABC data sheet. And this is where you just make note of any triggers or um, any, any sort of background setting events, antecedents, immediate triggers, where the behavior is occurring, what behavior happened, and any maintaining consequences. This is example, an example of interval recording where the observer can note if a behavior was present during an interval. It might be a 10 second interval, some people do a 15 second interval. And in your write up of this, you want to make sure that you note if you were recording whether the behavior was present, present for the entire interval or whether you were recording whether a behavior was present during just part of the interval. Um, this is an example of collecting scatterplot data. And just in glancing at this, you can see that this particular student was exhibiting the target behavior more frequently in the mornings, more frequently in the afternoon, not so much midday. So in developing um, some hypotheses, around what might be going on with this student, you would want to take a look at, well, what is the protective factor in the middle of the day that, that diminishes the likelihood that that target behavior will, um, will be demonstrated? And another type of observation is event recording, where the observer would note the behavior, the time period of the observation, and just tally each occurrence of the target behavior. So this is good for things like talking out and touching others. It's useful for determining um, the amount or frequency of a behavior. And this is an example of duration recording where we want to discern how long a behavior lasts. So if a child is, um, if a target behavior is wandering around the room, the observer would note when that behavior started and when it ended. And so all of this can be helpful in um, determining not only the baseline of a behavior that is problematic, um, but then once appropriate strategies and interventions are put in place, we can repeat these kinds of inter observation strategies to see if a student's behavior is improving. And then a latency recording technique helps us to determine how long um, until a behavior starts. So if a teacher gives a direction, how long until the student complies with that direction. So the next key of doing a TBI assessment is doing a good interview. Um, we want to make sure that parents, teachers, any appropriate outside school-based professionals, and medical providers are interviewed. And that can help us better understand a student's strengths and weaknesses. And very importantly is it can help us discern what their pre-injury functioning was. Um, we can also, from a good interview, get information about the student's functioning that we can't easily observe or test at school. Things like their sleep habits, their eating habits, their relationships with siblings, how perhaps have they changed, and that student's medical history. Again, with that parent interview, you want to make sure you have that careful line of questioning related to the student's um, any previous head injury and the background of what the student was like cognitively, emotionally, and socially before their injury. 
there are a few different formats that the interview can take, and I recommend doing um, multiple types of formats. So having a more unstructured interview technique, you know, tell me about how Katie is um, sleeping. Tell me a little bit about how she gets along with her friends. Um, and then also doing something a little bit more structured, like a norm-referenced interview, because that can provide a score that compares the student to typical same-age peers. So the Vineland Adaptive Behavior Scales is a type of interview that allows the evaluator to collect data on the student's adaptive behavior self-care and so forth, and not just describe how the student is performing at that point in time, but also compares them to um, other students their age. Do checklists and rating scales are particularly useful for monitoring changes as a result of intervention. It can help refine observations, so if you've done your observations and you've noticed that a student has trouble with keeping her hands to herself, you can utilize rating scales to see, you can utilize checklists to see how frequently that's occurring, you can utilize rating scales to see um, how, how bad the behavior is. Um, it can help guide the formulation of intervention strategies. And generally, checklists and rating scales involve a rater such as someone who knows the child well, their parent or their teacher, endorsing or checking off whether or not a child exhibits a particular skill or behavior. Um, and a rating scale will help quantify how often or to what degree a skill or behavior is exhibited. So usually this is a fairly quick and easy way of collecting data, and it's a really nice complement to um, an objective outside observation. So here's just one example of um, a rating scale. A direct behavior rating is something that can be created, it can be tailored for a specific student and behavioral goal. So for example, we'll say Johnny's receiving a behavioral intervention and it focuses on following classroom rules. His teachers might twice daily complete a one to five rating of Johnny's behavior. Um, and that would discern how well he behaved in the classroom. So this example here actually stretches the rating scale out to a 10. If you have younger students who might have trouble understanding the number scale, you can scale it on a sad face to happy face. And one way that I really like to use a daily rating scale is to have the teacher complete the rating, but also to have the student complete the rating, especially students with brain injuries, because one of the areas of impairment may be their self-awareness. So if you have a student who had a bad day, they had a one or two day, and the teacher, for example, rates them as a two, sometimes you'll have a student who um, isn't able to see that in themselves. They, they aren't able to accurately self-monitor, and so every day is a nine or a 10. But if you have a student who has a bad day, they have a two day, and they're able to accurately self-monitor and circle that two and say, I know that I didn't follow rules well today because I did this and I did this and I did that. Um, that can actually be a positive thing because they, they have developed that self-awareness and that might lend, uh, lend itself to the development of different intervention strategies than a student who has poor classroom behavior and is continually giving themselves the 9 or 10 and doesn't see that the problem exists. So these kinds of rating scales can also be completed by parents, related service personnel, and even by the students to evaluate their, um, their self-perceptions and self-awareness. And this is just some examples of former, formal checklists and rating scales. 
Um, and this PowerPoint is going to be made available to all of you afterwards. So I'm not going to read through all of these, but you will just be able to have them at hand and um, research them a little bit more on your own, see which um, scales your school district might have available. Then standardized norm reference tests, those are systematic and pre-planned methods of testing, has the same set of instructions for all students, same criteria for scoring and interpretation, and it allows us to compare a student's knowledge and skills to typical same age peers. And they can be administered individually or to a group to evaluate a variety of domains. Um, we want to make sure that we're not over-relying on test scores from norm reference tests when making decisions about students with TBI. Because as I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, that overall global or standard score may not fully represent what's going on with the student. We often see uneven patterns of performance, and so we want to make sure that in addition to looking at a child's overall cognitive ability, that we also consider how they're performing in um, different subdomains like their verbal ability, nonverbal ability, um, and processing speed and working memory in particular are often significantly impaired in students who've sustained TBIs. Um, and again, their, their scores on standardized tests may be inconsistent with their daily functioning. So we want to look at this in concert with information that we're getting from the classroom, from our observations and um, interviews. IQ tests can show knowledge of previously learned information, but what they're not so good at doing is addressing the student's ability to learn new information, which is a common area of TBI impairment and something that you really want to look carefully at when collecting the classroom data. So this is a list of some of the commonly used standardized cognitive tests in schools. And then there are also our standardized academic achievement tests, which again you want to look at in concert with the classroom-based assessment. So our typical classroom-based assessments are measuring specific skills that were taught. The academic achievement tests that are standardized measure academic area, um, specific academic areas compared to typical same age peers to a, to a norm group. So some examples of areas that we can look at are reading, writing, math, and oral language skills. And then each of those skill areas can be broken down into different subdomains to help us better discern where specific problem areas may lie. Here are some of the common academic tests that you may see utilized in schools. And then these are some standardized norm reference tests that evaluate other domains that can be affected by a TBI. Typically in schools, you're not going to see educational teams administering neuropsychological batteries, but what they may be called on to do is to integrate data from an outside neuropsych report into their school-based evaluation. And so it's important that school-based evaluation teams be familiar with um, the names and the domains of the different types of tests that outside evaluators may be using. Um, I was always a fan of this particular memory test, the RAML, when working with students with TBI because that is a standardized test that can help us evaluate a child's memory and learning, like learning for new information. There are several tests that specifically measure executive function and the brief, the behavior rating inventory of executive function is one that is used fairly regularly in schools and can um, really help to discern a student's level of functioning in terms of their, um, their executive function, their problem solving, their judgment, their impulsivity. Um, attention and concentration, the, the forward and backward digit span test on the Weschler scales on the WISC um, is a good measure of attention and concentration. 
The language and verbal learning tests are ones that are heavily relied on by speech and language therapists. You've got your visual perceptual assessments. The developmental test of visual perception, or the VMI, is one that may be used by your school teams. And then there are evaluations or tests of motor skills. So the grooved pegboard is just one example, but occupational therapists and physical therapists will have a plethora of specific tests that they use for evaluating motor skills. Um, just a quick note about curriculum-based measures, because I know we're running short on time. Um, this is a good, quick, cheap method of doing a point-in-time evaluation of a student's skills in a specific curricular area. So when we're looking at doing our progress monitoring of students with TBI, um, obviously you're not going to give a full a battery of tests on a weekly basis, but this is a really good way of monitoring their trajectory of improvement for specific curricular areas like their reading fluency, their math fluency. It's useful for screening, progress monitoring, um, making diagnoses and instructional planning and prognosis, and it helps teachers to um, work efficiently, produce accurate and meaningful um, information about a student's growth. So um, often with students with TBI, we'll see those pretty significant deficits post-injury, and a brief, quick curriculum-based measure is one way that we can, on a weekly basis, see if a student is improving in a specific academic domain. So just one example, you might have a student complete a reading probe where they are reading aloud from grade level text. An evaluator can tally how many words that student reads correctly in a minute to help identify any specific areas of academic struggle, allow for monitoring of progress in specific subjects. And this is one really good way of comparing the student's pre-injury to post-injury function. Because even though you might not have a pre-injury um, IQ score on an individual IQ test, many schools do have pre-existing curriculum-based measures that you would be able to compare the student's functioning, a uh, student's performance to um, post-injury. Um, just a quick note on functional behavior assessments. When I was discussing the observational and interview strategies, those are key strategies for carrying out a full functional behavior assessment. So if specific, particularly if you have a student with a traumatic brain injury who um, is experiencing significant behavioral issues, uh, doing a sound functional behavioral assessment is a good way of uh, identifying what triggers of behaviors are and what are maintaining consequences and can help inform your intervention plan. And then um, finally, computer-based neurocognitive tests like the IMPACT is a way of comparing a student's baseline functioning to post-injury functioning. Typically now, these are really only given to our student athletes. And it's a computer-administered assessment that many student athletes, especially in high school settings, will take preseason. And if they sustain a concussion during the season, they may take that impact test to see to compare their post-injury performance to their pre-injury performance. And the goal is to bring the student's score back to baseline before allowing active return to play. But like with all of these other strategies that we've discussed this evening, that test should only be used along with other assessment strategies and a comprehensive evaluation from a healthcare provider. Um, so just to summarize, a few of the challenges in school-based TBI assessment are that you may be dealing with a student who is fatigued cognitively and physically. They may have some apathy and be frustrated with their um, newly diminished skills, especially if they have that awareness that their, uh, 
that their functioning, that their memory, their cognition, their academic skills are different than they were before their injury. And they may have some trouble with impulse control. So when doing your school-based assessment, make sure that you're building in breaks, that you're really paying attention to the student, and whether he or she are showing signs of fatigue, giving the student sufficient time to respond, um, taking that time to build rapport and, as with any assessment, taking care to test the student in an environment that is free of distractions. So just to review, um, a medical diagnosis of TBI doesn't necessarily mean that the student will qualify for special education. It is a school-based team determination, and the key questions that the team is going to be answering is, does our evaluation data show that after the TBI there are significant declines in the different domains of functioning? Is it significant? Is there an adverse effect on the student's educational performance? And does the student require specially designed instruction? Also making sure that um, the student doesn't meet any of the rule out criteria, um, like the problems being attributable solely to limited English proficiency or a lack of instruction. Um, and then keeping in mind that if the student's not found eligible for special education and only needs accommodations, a 504 plan may be written to allow accommodations um, for such students who don't require specially designed instruction and you would continue to monitor such students with good assessment practices. And then if a student does qualify for services, then he or she would receive an individualized education program. Um, and the goals, objectives, and, um, and programs that are described on that IEP may be very, quite variable depending on the student's unique needs. Um, and finally, it's really important to keep in mind that the student will require frequent reevaluation more frequently than um, typical students who are on an IEP because he or she may be um, you know, recovering quite quickly, which is certainly what we hope for. So I want to um, turn it over to Melissa and Amanda to see if there are any questions that we can take. Well, so far we don't have any questions unless somebody has something they want to type in. Um, that's it. So, and I don't see anyone typing. So what I will tell you is if you do have questions as you think through this or um, things come up in your life working with kids with TBI, feel free to email myself. Um, and if I don't know the answer, I will send it on to Susan. Um, or you can email Amanda. I think most of you have at least Amanda's email because she's been communicating with you. And we'll get it in the hands of the right folks to get, the, get your questions answered. Um, the other thing I wanted to let you know is that the handouts are coming later. Um, we're going to send them tomorrow? Probably tomorrow. Probably tomorrow. Um, if not, early next week. The other question I have for folks, and if you can put this in the chat, that would be great. Um, the TBI liaisons have asked me to let them know how many people from their regions and whatnot show up. So if you have more than one person at your computer with you, can you type in those people's names? Um, and yes, uh, Lori's asking about the PowerPoint. Yes, it will be available. So if you can type in people's names in the chat that are sitting next to you that maybe don't show up on my, on my list, that would be awesome. Um, and that is all we have, I believe. Oh, and the recording will be put online. Right? Yep, and we are going to be putting the recording online, so we'll let you know where that can be found. It's actually on the um, Seabert YouTube right now, yes? This one? It'll be on the Seabert YouTube. It'll be Seabert YouTube. It'll be posted on the Teams page. Yeah, on the Teams page. So, okay. Well, thank you, Susan, so, so much for doing that. All right, thank you very much. Oh, we have another question. Oh, oh, it's just people telling us who's on. Okay. Well, um, <laughs> Susan has to get going to her daughter's thing at school, so we're going to let you go. Okay, Susan? <laughs> All right. Thank you. Take care. Thank you so much. All right. Bye-bye.